Okay. All right. Yeah, it's from Thor. As long as you just pardon me. We do like you. Well, I, I don't know that I believe you. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so this this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, um, dinner same time. It'll follow the it'll be a service that follows that, and then inevitably I will go by dailies on the way back to get something to drink on the way home, and I'll have my little mark on there. And, <laughs> The, you know, by then the person behind the counter has probably seen a few people throughout the day, that, so I don't hear you have dirt on your forehead. Um, but it depends, because when the kids do it, yes. they got a lot of. Well, first of all, let me just admit, you get, they, you get warm. they have a lot of they have a lot of forehead to work with on me, um, and it's like a canvas for them, and they're just you know. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I usually end up with a well represented smudge or cross or something so anyway that's this Wednesday and we begin the Lenten season I mean it's always strange for me every year because we we finish up Advent and then the Christmas and you know Epiphany is January 6th and then a month later you blink and it's Christmas it's, it's Lenten you know the Lenten season and it really sometimes depends all these things kind of start at different times and so uh, this year it's it's not really early, it's kind of like a week later I think than it is some other times, but anyway, so that starts this week, so uh, I think we are starting a new sermon series on holiness that's going to go along with the Lenten season, so uh, Pastor Philip will be uh, preaching on that this coming Sunday, so you can be ready for that. So let me pray for us and we'll get started with our lesson. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for our time together uh, this morning, and we thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. We thank you that it really is a light unto our paths, um, it, that you have called us, Lord, to be the light of the world as you are the light of the world, and we have an opportunity to be salt and light to a dark and decaying world that is in desperate need of your Son, Jesus Christ. So we are so grateful that we can gather in your name. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us, guide our conversation, and let all the things we talk about glorify and honor you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And guess what I'm going to do real quick. Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. What's going on in there? I don't know. Yeah. All right. Angie's over there talking to some people. So if y'all will uh, turn to Lesson 10, we'll be talking about spreading the word. And so we've been in a couple, last few weeks, last few lessons we've been talking about persecution and suffering of the early church and let me just say that's not really ever going to stop that's going to be something that's just a part of the book of Acts because that was a part of the the history of the early church that was a in fact it wasn't until I think 325 when Constantine became emperor of Rome that uh, there was a lot of persecution. Now, some, some emperors, uh, Nero, for example, it was oppressive. I mean, he, he was going hard after the Christians, and it was bad news. There were others that tolerated it more, and then people in between. So there was never a great time uh, for Christians. But when Constantine came, and he supposedly had a vision of a cross in the sky, and sort of, I don't know, stated that Christianity was now going to be the official uh, religion of Rome. Uh, now, some people say that was the worst thing that ever happened because the church had been growing and all that, but as soon as the persecution stopped, that's when it kind of started becoming institutionalized, and, you know, you can make an argument that it got easy to become a Christian, and therefore... You hear that in a lot of places in the world where there's a lot of persecution, the church is growing, and as soon as they become domesticated, so to speak, or become, you know, it's easy to become a Christian, like in our country, that all of a sudden it doesn't, be it doesn't become that important. I uh, may have shared this with y'all before, but when I was on the Board of Ordained Ministry, uh, we interviewed, we had quite a number of folks who had come from Cuba and we're going, there were candidates for ministry. Now they, this is sort of very, this is unfortunate, but this is just 
the way the system worked. These people had been pastors in Cuba. In some cases, they had uh, been district superintendents and things like that, but they, they sort of had to start over again when they came here. And so they went through the process. Now, we, I will say that we weren't, I don't want to say we weren't as thorough. We were thorough, but we knew that they had all this experience. We just wanted to get to know them and talk to them. So there was one fellow in particular, he was great. And we just really, we almost, it was almost like we were sitting at his feet learning from him. He was, he had a lot of great things to say. And so uh, one of the people in our little small group, there were about seven or eight of us and we'd interview a candidate uh, before they would go to the large group of about 60 people. I want you to know every pastor that you've ever had had to sit in front of about 60 or 70 people and everybody firing questions at them. <laughs> Yours truly also had to go through that. That was, that was not an exciting time in my life. Um, but anyway, this guy was great. He handled himself well. We, it was easy to see that he really was called by God. He was equipped by God. He had a thriving ministry in Cuba. So we really just wanted to, to chat with him. And we asked him, he was serving a small local church in Miami. And we asked him, what was your experience from when you served in Cuba as a pastor to your experience now mm -hmm. down in Miami? And now this statement's going to sound a little strange when I first tell you, but then I'll explain it and it'll make some sense to you. He said, those who were part of my congregation in Cuba who also came, he said, I don't see as often anymore. He said, because now you can go out and buy a pair of shoes anytime you want. And what, that was more of a metaphor for they have freedom they never had before. And when they lived in Cuba, they needed the church. Now, they need the church now. Uh, and so he wasn't saying they don't need it anymore, but the perception is the church is all we had. Jesus was all we had in Cuba. And when they come to, come to America, they have all these freedoms now that they didn't, never experienced before. And he used the example of being able to go out and buy a pair of shoes anytime they want, whereas they didn't have that. So anyway, that, that was just an interesting experience. But... That's why some people say one of the worst things that ever happened to the church and church history was when it became the official state religion of Rome because then it, became, it in, many, in many places it became a lukewarm religion instead of this fiery thing that we're reading about in the book of Acts. So that's just, I want to give you some, con, some uh, comparison and contrast between what we're reading about in Acts versus what will happen you know, two and a half centuries later uh, in Roman history, or church history, rather, the Roman Empire. So let's, um, let's read that opening uh, paragraph there. And uh, it says this, The first missionary journey was at once inspiring and terrifying, a blessing and a trial. When Paul and Barnabas returned from their journey, they reported back full of excitement to the church which sent them out. God had done tremendous things. Many became Christians. Churches were established. Elders appointed. Their messages affirmed by miracles and the word of God spread. They also reported uh, of opposition from the religious leaders and being kicked out of cities and stoned, at times close to the point of death. Through it all, however, they knew they would not be stopped because the Holy Spirit sent them and went with them. So, uh, y'all know in about three, well, no, gosh, next week. This year is flying by already for me, so I'm losing track. <laughs> I'm just getting old, y'all. But, um, so, it, but next week I think it is, or certainly the week after, but in the next couple weeks we're having Missions Week yeah. where we'll have missionaries come speaking to us and all that. And um, there's one missionary, he's spoken at Southside before, I don't believe he is this year. Um, he has been in, um, oh, uh, 
No, this is the fella in West Africa. It will come to me in a minute. Um, but his name's Rick Arnold, and he and his family are there. And they have been so they live in a village, and it's almost 100% Muslim. And they've been there for over three decades. And um, they have been faithful. And both he and his wife were raised in Africa as well by parents who were missionaries. Their children, I think a lot of them live here in the States now. They, they've gotten married or they're in college or things like that. But they're there for about four years, maybe five, and then they come back for a year furlough and they visit the churches that they've received support from and give them reports on, here's what God's doing, where we are. And they have seen, they have seen converts, um, but people aren't inclined to talk about it a lot because they might be ostracized from their families. Uh, they might you know, be punished in other ways as well. So there's a lot on the line, but the first decade or so was just building relationships, saying I'm, we're a family you can trust and all that. And uh, one of the neat stories that Rick likes to tell is that when someone gets bitten by a snake, for example, they've got apparently some very poisonous snakes in that area where they live, and um, they, um, the name, the, the name's going to drive me crazy, that, the name of the, where they're living, um, starts with an S, West Africa, anyway, um, Somalia? Som I don't think it's Somalia, but it, that, that's what I was thinking in my head, but they, um, so they, the people will bring the snake victim, the snake bite victim, to Rick and his wife and say, would you please pray because you have a powerful God? Because they have seen so many miracles happen and stuff like that. So Rick and his wife, they'll pray over them. They, I mean, they treat them as well. They, you know, so it's a, sort of a both end, but they, they pray and they're healed and... So, God's got a great reputation, but because of, you know, centuries of tradition, these people are Muslim, and so they're, they're not quick to, because they feel like maybe they're doing more than just portraying their understanding of God, they're portraying family and custom and tradition, and also, what kind of response are we going to get, but when they're in trouble, they go to the, the missionary, the Christian missionaries. So, all that is to say, um, look at that opening question there. It says, what do you think would be the most difficult, uh, be most difficult about being a missionary? So, whether, you know, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in China, whether it's in South America, uh, what would come to your mind, Sean? I think it, walking into a new place, not knowing anyone, and trying to get to know them yeah. on their levels where you can bring what you're bringing. Mm -hmm. That would be hard. You really have to have patience, don't you? Oh, yes. And not expect this overnight. <coughs> people just all of a sudden <coughs> can't wait. They line up to come to Jesus just because you show up. Mm -hmm. um, not being overly sensitive. Y'all yeah. know Amy Franks, and her, yeah. sister, her sister is uh, a missionary, her whole family. And they, they went to a French-speaking place. I think they went to uh, was it Morocco or Monaco. I mean, I know they went to Morocco, Morocco first. And they had to leave there, right? Yes. Um, but where, in fact, French is very, in some places in Africa, that's their, mm -hmm. that's their primary language. Mm -hmm. So they had to learn French. But they, they have gone and they... But so much of it, like Shauna was saying, is just building the relationships with the people for a while. It's not, you don't just start out of the gate, stand on the corner, uh, and start preaching the gospel. Because in some of these places, your life expectancy <laughs> would be pretty low. And so, uh, you know, you have to be, as Jesus said, wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. Um, so anyway, but what are some other things that come to your mind about what would be tough about being a missionary? Being able to adjust to the culture shock differential yeah. and not tell the people 
how we did it in New York. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And that's a great point, Bill, because yeah, one of the early things they learned early on when Western countries started sending missionaries to these other parts of the world is that they were bring, bringing our culture, not, not just the gospel. And so what missi missiologists, those who study missions and, and send out missionaries, what they learned is we're bringing the gospel so that it fits the context of who these people are and where they live. We're not bringing Western culture. Uh, and because that's sometimes, the, you know, you think, some people think that Christianity is a Western religion. Well, no, it was born in the Middle East. I mean, it was born. It's, it's, it's definitely not, but it's being perceived as that in some corners of the world. What else comes to mind about what would be, Anne? Well, I, I, some of you may have heard this story before, but uh, at age 10 in 1956, my father and mother and I were stationed in Canitra, Morocco, Port Leone, Port Leone Navy Base, which had opened up after World War II, okay? And, uh, of course, we were in an Arabic country, Islamic country, but the country where had, there had, it was French Morocco, so the French had been there, and there were Christians there. Uh, there was, I think, one, ca one Catholic church, small church in Canitra, and then we were the Americans, who were the rich Americans who came in, and part of the culture that we were told was that uh, and, and, and lived it, was that first of all, we had each family that lived off base. We lived off base because there was not enough base housing. Mm -hmm. And we, we had to employ a gardener and a maid, mm -hmm. you know, to help the local economy. So there were two other families on the same street that we were on. So we became, my mother, who was very um, talented, uh, linguist, linguistically in many other ways, she was, had the gift of hospitality. But she became best friends with the gardener and with the maid. Um, um, and, um, but we also had to get a German shepherd that the Navy provided us to have in our house at nighttime. And um, because, because we were Christians, you know, Amer rich Americans, it was okay to steal from us because, you know, you hear stories of Islam, you know, uh, cutting off hands for stealing. That's only for mother believers, not for non-believers. So anything was a go for for non-believers, right. which the Americans were. And there were certain areas of town we were not allowed to go to. Yeah. And then we visited uh, Mule Idris, which was a town up in the mountains that was, if you went to Mule Idris three times as a, as a Muslim for pilgrimage, it was the same as going to Mecca once. You know, oh, okay. had to wear your red hat because that was the furthest way that the uh, area that the Muslim uh, religion had gone, you know. So um, uh, it was a very interesting time in my life. I mean, of course, I had my friends who were American, except for uh, the friends of, of uh, the waiter we had at a restaurant we went to all the time. And uh, he and my mother became very good friends, and uh, she picked up Arabic just like that. and then. Uh, I was studying French and Vietnam. But anyway, he came knocking at our door one time and said, can you help me, you you know? Because his daughter had been stolen. She was my age. We'd been to their house. She was a friend of mine. And um, so uh, uh, he, she'd been stolen. And after a month, they gave up. And she'd been put in the, in the slave trade. So, which was the reason why there was a, a Navy uh, shore patrol with a gun on the school bus that picked us up at the end of the street every morning and brought us home and made sure we walked in our doors every night, which I did not realize until after I learned about her. So it's a very different culture, yeah. and um, and um, but we were con still considered people of the book because they are descendants of Abraham as well, <coughs> right. you know, but we had the wrong Messiah. Yeah, yeah, wrong Jesus. Wrong, wrong Messiah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a great example of, uh, so there are cultural differences, there are language barriers, there's also being lonely, you know, being alone, I mean, as you're beginning, now, our, my friend Rick that I mentioned earlier, uh, they've been there so long now, they really are part of the community, but there are all these customs, there are things that we would never do here that are ordinary there and vice versa, um, 
And then being away from family for long periods of time, very long periods of time, uh, lots of things like that. So, you know, it's no small thing when God calls you to be a missionary, and um, but certainly, a, I mean, uh, you know, I mentioned to y'all, Jake, my son Jake, was, he was gone a month and a half. Um, and I mean, I was like just sad every day, oh, Jake's never coming back. You know, like, that's a month and a half, you know, get over yourself. He wants to go again this summer, so y'all pray for me. Um, <laughs> I had a girl that worked with me years ago. She was in her 20s when her and her husband graduated from Trinity Baptist College. They became missionaries and went over to West Africa. Is that right? And they actually stayed there and raised, they raised three children yep. over there. Yep. So, I mean, it, it took time to yep. get into it, but then yeah. no, I mean, they, there was production. And, and it just shows you it's a calling. Well, right underneath that opening question there, it says, uh, we're going to read Acts 12, 25 uh, through 13, 4. <laughs> And it says, the previous study ended with the thrilling words, but the word of God continued to increase and spread. Now Luke has reached a decisive turning point in his narrative. In keeping with the risen Lord's prophecy in 1 verse 8, witness has been born to him in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. Now the horizon broadens to the ends of the earth. Up to this point, all the actions and evangelism well, excuse me, all the action in evangelism has been limited to the Palestinian and Syrian mainland. Nobody has yet caught the vision of taking the good news to the nations overseas, although Cyprus has been mentioned in 11 uh, verse 19. Now at last, however, the momentous step is to be taken. So let's read uh, Acts 12, 25 through 13 verse 4. So beginning with verse 25, it says, When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping, the Lord and fasting, so they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So you'll notice throughout Acts and other letters as well, the laying on of hands is an important symbol. It is, uh, in this case, it was, who was it that said, send Barnabas and Silas? The Holy Spirit. I mean, uh, Holy Spirit. Si who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yeah. So uh, Saul, not Silas, but Saul and Barnabas, uh, the, while they were worshiping, while they were praying, while they were fasting, they were led to believe the Holy Spirit set apart Barnabas and Saul for this work. Um, and so they did more fasting and praying. Then everyone laid their hands. Paul will say that to Timothy later in uh, Paul's letters to Timothy, where he says, you remember when the elders laid hands on you? Uh, when I was ordained, they laid hands on me. Um, when um, some churches do this, we haven't done this in a while. We've done this in the past, but it's been a long time. When uh, we are sending off, uh, like the Guatemala team, going to head down, that we will gather around and lay hands on them and just pray. And there's nothing magic in that, but it's really just an expression of, you know, we're just asking for the Spirit to bless them, to fill them, to protect them, to help their trip be fruitful and, and, uh, and all the rest. And, um, but there is something about you know the the, the touch that it, it's it is a symbol to be sure but it it's almost a conferral of blessing in a way you know could you do that with their what when did we just recently do this oh we had a um uh, one of our guys uh on monday night was going through a tough time and so actually he was leading us in prayer that night and he didn't mention his own issue 
and I knew he wasn't going to. So I hopped up as soon as he got done, and I said, well, I knew he wasn't going to pray for himself, so I laid my hands on him. I said, brothers, if you just reach out and just, you know, and pray, and pray with me. And so we, we prayed for this uh, brother who's uh, going through a tough time. And there, there's power in that. Yeah. Um, it's not like we're not claiming, you know, the, the woman who had been sick and touched the, the hem of Jesus' robe. and was. We're not claiming any of that. Um, but we, I, we just, I think it's, I really do believe it's a means of grace. I, I think it's, I do want to say it's a symbol, and the prayer, of course, is a, a work of grace, a means of grace. But I don't know. I think that, that the touching is a meaningful uh, communicant of that. All right. So um, we read that. So let's take a look at that question number one. What is going on in these verses? That's the Dale Tedder version, paraphrase of that question. What is going on? Describe the scene here. What's going on? Herod disrespected the, the Lord, and he was rewarded for it with death. Yeah, yeah. Right before then, you remember that uh, touching scene where Herod, Herod was not touched by hands, he was touched by worms, um, which uh, I think we all cringed at when we read that. But with 25, 12, 25 through 13, 4, or 13, 3, really, um, what is, what's going on? Holy Spirit sending them out to the spread the church. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Get out fasted and prayed. Yeah, I mean, so A.W. Tozer, who is a Christian author who is just wonderful. Anything by A.W. Tozer, buy and then read because it'll bless you. But he's got a, a line from one of his books, I can't recall which one, where he's, this man was a man of prayer. He would get up at, I don't know, 3.30 or 4 in the morning. He'd pray for two or three hours. And... He was a pastor of a church uh, in Chicago for many, many, many years. And he had a he had a pair of, he would pray at home, but he would also pray in his office. Um, and don't ask me for how this worked, but he would close the door. I guess he would change pants and he put on his praying pants. He prayed so much the knees were worn out. On his knees. I mean, that's how often he, yeah, he was not just praying like I'm praying right now. I mean, he'd be on his knees before God in prayer. And so that was a man who took prayer seriously. And when I read things like that, I'm, I feel chastened by the Spirit saying, you couldn't even get out of bed before you start, you know, uh, this morning. You were, you were all comfy in bed this morning when you were praying. Um, Maybe if I had done that, my dog would have shut up last night. <laughs> Well, I don't know the exact correlation, but uh, you can try it. It couldn't hurt. Um, yeah, so they were being commissioned. They were being sent out. They were worshiping. They were praying. They were fasting. They were discerning God's will. That's a big part of it. If, if you really want to discern God's will you know, for your life or you're seeking counsel or a church, that's praying for God's will. You know, we did this certainly last year during all that fun. Um, but I know that people were fasting. People, certainly, certainly people were praying. But what we were doing is we were seeking to discern God's will. Uh, because what we Christians sometimes have a habit of doing, um, and it's an easy thing to fall into, we have our plan. Yeah. And when we pray, we're just asking God to sign off on what we already want to do. <laughs> God, if you would just rubber stamp this, here's a good plan, I've come up with it, I just want your okay. All right, that's how we do it often, but what we ought to do is, God, we want to do what you want us to do. Uh, please lead us, guide us, give us discernment, insight, and all that we need. So in this case, the Holy Spirit picked out Barnabas and Saul. Uh, he called them. They sent, sent them out. So, right under question one, I'll read that paragraph. It says, it's unlikely 
that the Holy Spirit revealed his will only to the small group of five leaders, for that would entail three of them being instructed about the other two. It's more likely that the church members as a whole are in mind, since both they and the leaders are mentioned together in verse 1. Moreover, when Paul and Barnabas returned, they gathered the church together. They reported to the church because they had been commissioned by the church. So that's always great. That's going to be one of the great parts about our mission week, is that when people come and report what God has been doing, and how they've been able to serve God, and you know, y'all, in the last handful of years we've had mission week, and it really is a blessing to see how God is working in other parts of the world, and to hear stories about how God's working, you know, through the lives of missionaries, and it, it's really exciting. So, question two, how does the way Paul and Barnabas are sent compare and contrast with how we send off our missionaries today? What did y'all do with that question? How did y'all answer that? <laughs> no All right, no Was idea. That's Holy, not... Holy Spirit, Don't, but would he do the same with both? Then and now, but probably ought to. Yeah. Do we do? Do we? Uh, well, I mean, I was going to say how we do it, but just in churches or missionaries you're familiar with, what are some things you notice with how it's done today versus maybe what's being described here? But they go to college. They're educated. Okay. The, they have missionary schools. Okay. They tell them how to do it. Yeah. Or or try and tell them how to start. Yeah. Most of it has to be learned. Yeah. On the job. Okay. But I don't think, I think people feel that they're asked by God to go into That's ministry. The Spirit. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think it's quite like the people who had the Holy Spirit because they could perform miracles. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's yeah. No fasting. Yeah. yeah. And well, there might not be, and there might be in some cases, some churches, uh, y'all probably have visited some churches where they have a, a whole wall when you're walking into the sanctuary, they have like a wall of missionaries that their church supports. We support a lot of missionaries, but we don't have that place. We, we have in the past, we've had different places. We'll probably see that um, next week of different places that we support. Uh, but there are ways to kind of remind the church to be in prayer for people that, you, you, that we as a church family support. There is one, just one thing I want to draw your attention to, and I think it works for both um, pastors, uh, evangelists, uh, and missionaries. When, there's a, when you become a pastor, there's a two-fold call to ministry. There's the inward call of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that when, if I'm on a district, if I'm on the district committee, for ordained ministry or if I'm on the, the conference board of ordained ministry, by the time they've gotten to the board, they've had to kind of communicate this to the district. But they will go, and the district will say, well, tell us about your call to ministry. Because it, it's, it's an opportunity for them to share the inward call that they have felt by the Spirit that, you know, Here's, what, here's some things that have happened in my life. Here's the direction that God has been leading me in my life. And now I'm at a place where I'm restless until I can serve God in a, as a pastor of a church or something. And you know they'll come and talk about different things that got them to that place. But there's always a twofold call. There, and, the, and this scripture today communicates this. There's the inward call of the Spirit, but there's the outward call of the church. Now let me tell you why that's important. The church, in a manner of speaking, doesn't mean the church is infallible and that we always get it right, but the church is, is entrusted with discerning if that person is really called for the purpose. And I will tell you this, that in the many years that I was on the Board of Ordained Ministry, there were some people that we did not ordain because we did not sense that they were being called for ministry. And this is our response. Because obviously we can't, we can't possibly know what God's really calling. God may be calling them to ministry. So what we ended up saying is, 
it, it seems God is clearly doing something in your life, but we just don't believe that God is calling you for ministry in the United Methodist Church. Now, God may be calling them for something else, but there are a series of things. Uh, maybe they're not exhibiting any gifts for ministry. And I will tell you this. Now, this is not to say we ever encountered anything like this when I was on the board. But I want to tell you the name of somebody. I believe most of y'all will recognize this name. This person applied for ordained ministry with the United Methodist Church. This person had a very active uh, ministry into the inner cities where he was helping people, uh, feeding people, caring for people, and all that sort of thing. It was a very active, sort of a social ministry. He was preaching and all that sort of thing. And one of the things you have to do as a United Methodist, and I'm sure it'll be the same with the Global Methodist, is that you have to take some psychological exa examinations to make sure you're, you're sound. Mm -hmm. That's what tripped this one person up. Mm. Now let me tell you his name. His name was Jim Jones. Oh. And he took, his, he took his act down to South America and uh, gave a lot of people Kool-Aid. Yeah. And that's where the phrase, do you drink the Kool-Aid, uh, comes from. And they all, a bunch of people died. He created a cult. So, you know, aren't you glad <laughs> that you didn't go to Jim Jones' church? Um, and uh, so... Now, that's an extreme, obviously that's an extreme over-the-top example, but that's just, that just gives you a big, you know, big vivid picture of what can happen in small, and some people, they feel, this is, I mean, you have to fill all this kind of stuff out in your, your psychologicals and all that. Some people feel they're called to ministry because their grandmother's dying wish is they would become a pastor. Yeah. And that's a big burden to put on somebody. Maybe you don't want to be, but you just love your grandmother. And that she means all the world to you, and she really helped you at a pivotal time to grow in your faith. And so you think you're supposed to do that. Or there are some people that have amazing uh, experiences of coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and it's just miraculous. But that doesn't necessarily translate to a call to serve as an ordained minister. It just means... You're, you're called to be a Christian, and you may be fantastic at whatever it is you do. Be the best Christian in the world in that setting. But not everybody's called to be a missionary or to be an evangelist or to be a pastor. So that's why there is the outward call of the church as well as the inward call of the Spirit. Both need to work together. And it does not mean that the church always gets it right, um, but it just shows you that both are important because if every person who felt an emotional experience where they felt, oh, this must be a call to ministry, if every single one of those persons became a pastor, you know, that might not be the best thing for the, the Church of Jesus Christ. So I think for the members yeah. of the church, it's important to know that our pastors do go through this step, these steps yeah. to become a pastor because we put a lot of Faith in our pastors. Yeah. So. Well, you yeah you want I mean and you know, this would be a rabbit trail that I could really get in trouble on, so I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> but there are churches, there are some churches where it's far easier to become a pastor in that denomination. Yeah. yeah. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so let's look at number three. How does the church of the 21st century need to change? in order to follow the example of the early church in missions. So this really is just based on what we've learned so far in the first, third, well, 12 chapters and four verses uh, of what we've read so far in the book of Acts. What, if, what have you picked up on that you say, you know, this is really something we need to be more intentional about or something we need to change or do differently? What would y'all say? More witnessing, maybe? All right, so just even in our own church setting, yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Witness. 
here's a thought, uh, and I'll tell you who can really, we can all just, when you see her next time, give her uh, a hug and a, a thank you and all that. But, you know, Amy Frank is now, but Amy Frank has been taking kids on a mission trip to Guatemala. That's a week. Um, you know, it's not some long-term mission project, but it gives them a little taste of, of what mission work could be like. And that might whet the appetite or ignite something in the spirit. So we need to cultivate uh, missions. And, you know, just as, uh, you know, pastors are always looking for people that... Because sometimes God gives us a sense of someone who may be called to ministry. And we might say, hey, let's go grab lunch. Tell me about your faith. What's going on? What's God doing in your life? Have you ever thought about... Uh, and they may not be, sometimes it's not ordained ministry. There are some uh, people at our church who, they have a passion like I've never seen. We'll hear from some of them, I think, this coming, or next week, uh, for, they're, they're missionaries in prison. They go to the prison setting, and they share the gospel there, and they do great work. And it's not just like the one time and they're done. They continue to go back and visit on weekends and things like that. So that's sort of a combination of missions and evangelism. Is that and, Kairos? And it's Kairos ministry, yeah. yeah. So, uh, the, you know, there are they're, they're different ways. And so probably I'll just say this, because I don't ever want to... Sometimes we move quickly to this, and I don't want to lose the focus of going... God may be calling folks for overseas missions... And I want to emphasize that. But there's also ways you can serve locally. You know, and so there, there are different things. There are um, uh, in, -reach, in reach missions, I guess you could say, where you're ministering to the local community. In a, you could call it missions or evangelism or whatever you want to call it. But then there are, because there are people in this world who still have not heard of Jesus Christ. I mean, look, like, billions. <laughs> so... I mean, not even heard of them. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, so we can really encourage that. So let me read the summary that is below question three, or wherever it appears on your study guide. Um, and it says, Would it not be true to say that the Spirit sent them out by instructing the church to do so, and that the church sent them out having been directed by the Spirit to do so? This balance will be a healthy corrective to opposite extremes. The first is the tendency to individualism, by which a Christian claims personal or direct personal guidance by the Spirit without any reference to the church. The second is the tendency of institutionalism, by which all decision-making is done by the church without any reference to the Spirit. Although we have no liberty to deny the validity of personal choice, it is safe and healthy only in relation to the Spirit and the Church. Still today is, <coughs> pardon me. Still today it is the responsibility of every local church, especially of its leaders, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in order to discover who He may be gifting and calling. So that's really what I was just talking about there. Okay, well my voice is finally saying, you're done reading. Um... So, I'd like, would someone read verses 4 through 12 of chapter 13? Can I get a volunteer? Okay. Or, and? Sure. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, 4 through 12, and this, this relates to uh, questions 4 and 5. Um, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Okay. So, so, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But, but Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. 
Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, oh will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately... Right. Thank you. Is that okay? So I want you to take special notice of verse 10. Do not use this casually if you're talking to somebody. Do not say, you are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Uh, will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Uh, Paul did that because he was filled by the Spirit. Uh, and Paul, as an apostle, uh, know, know that the apostles had, and, and some of the prophets uh, that were still around, I mean, they were given special moments of discernment by the Spirit and things like that. So we want to be careful before we start calling people. Uh, but on the other hand, don't think that people like the sorcerer, there's, um, you know, we got people, we got Satanists who want to put their idols in state houses and things like that uh, in our government. Um, so there's plenty of evil roaming the land, but uh, be a little more temperate here. Uh, <laughs> it is interesting that Paul used the word of blindness Yeah, because he was experienced in that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, no, that's a good point. And yeah, and so it's like, all right, if you're going to walk in darkness, we're going to show you how dark it can actually get. That's exactly right. They're doing that, right? So let's look at question four. Uh, Ian, thank you for reading that. So contrast the proconsul with Elymas the sorcerer. So isn't that neat? Like, and, you know, they encountered sorcerers, you know, and things like that, or at least people who claim to be that. So um, what are the uh, what what are, what are the contrast here? Well, the proconsul was looking for God in the mm -hmm. the sorcerer was. Looking to keep him away from God. Yeah. So, basically, to control him. Yeah. There's, there's going to be a couple times where we see that throughout. There are those who want God, and there are those who want they, what they think God can give them yeah. to increase their own power or their own credibility or influence yeah. or whatever. Yeah, so the pro proconsul had a genuine desire to know the truth, he wanted to hear the word of God. He submitted to Christ when he heard it. The sorcerer had an evil agenda, and he did not care for the truth of God's word. Um, and Luke, remember Luke is writing all this, Luke makes that very clear. Um, so, uh, Pro Council was also very impressed when he was blinded. Yeah. <laughs> you get your attention. Uh, yeah, because... Yeah, so it says, uh, you will not see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then verse 12, to, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. <laughs> it's like, all right, I got my attention. Or he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So that's interesting. So remember, I know I, I've, this is my 13th time saying this, but... Miracles performed are always pointing to the teaching that they're that the power of God, the person of Jesus, salvation. It's always pointing beyond itself. So it's not just a miracle just for the sake of doing a miracle. It's always pointing to something beyond itself, which I think is really important. I bet he was totally shocked. Yeah. Well, so let me just share something that I think is really important that I don't know if y'all ever find yourself doing this. Even though I, even though I know what I'm about to tell y'all, and I say it a lot, and I believe it with all my heart, I can still find myself falling into it. And that is, well, that was 2,000 years ago. They weren't quite as bright as we were, and don't know about, didn't know about science and all that kind of stuff. And I, so I hear this with reference to the resurrection more than anything else. I heard one person say one time. 
You know, people didn't have a habit of just hopping back up from the dead back then either. <laughs> if someone died, they stayed dead. And so when Jesus came back to life, that got their attention. Well, here's something else. Back then, people didn't just all of a sudden, you know, people weren't just going blind left and right, you know. People would, go blind, go blind, go blind. So it didn't happen any more then than it would happen now. Um, but this is a special time in the history of the church when the apostles and particular prophets were still roaming the land and God was doing work through them. Because remember, we've mentioned this before, the church was a little baby church. It was just still starting out. I mean, it was at, God was adding thousands to their number. But remember, they, weren't, they were barely registering on the Roman radar screen. They were still sort of a subversion or subsect of Judaism. But the more they started growing, the more the Gentiles started becoming a part of it, that's when they became a problem. That's when they got on the Roman radar screen. And that's when they started facing a lot of persecution, not just from the Jews who had a problem, but now from the Romans. And that's going to be really the second half of Acts, where Paul is, he's actually, he's got battle, he's fighting on two fronts. Because he's got the Jews attacking him on one side, he's got the Romans attacking him on the other. And so he has quite a problem. So any questions on any of that so far? Yeah. Just a comment. Sure. Sometimes these, um, when these things occurred, the blindness or whatever, there was also um, something that accompanied it, like the mist fell over him or the bright light yeah. shone in his eyes. Those types of things seem to accompany some yeah. of these um occurrences from God. Yeah, and think about that. That's a good point. Think about when uh, the apostle, well, Saul, before he was an apostle, uh, the people around him heard thunder. Right. You know, I mean, it was, they heard thunder, Paul heard word. He heard, you know, he was having a conversation with Jesus. So it may have been heard yet not understood, but there were manifestations of physical reality happening. Was it when and I don't know, I may have this wrong, so I apologize if I do, but when Christ died, didn't the earth shake? Yeah. And the, it's like an earthquake, and it's one of the temples fell? Or yeah, well, the veil in, a temp, in the temple, which was, I, I did a, I think I used one of these TV sets one time to show y'all, I mean, this thing, it was like multiple phone book thickness. Uh-huh. And, it, and it was really tall, and it ripped from the top. Yeah down to the bottom. I mean, it just tore in two, um, and it signified that there is no longer a barrier between us and God. I mean, I get goosebumps every time I think about that. That is so powerful, and that's just the power of God. Yeah, so that's a, that's a big time, you know, manifestation. Not to mention it was followed by a resurrection. Uh, which is not too bad. Uh, <laughs> was, that, was that not also darkness upon it? Darkness, yeah, the sun, yeah, blotted out. I mean, yeah, it's just a whole host of things. So uh, God was saying, I don't even want anybody to miss this. This is still people, and yet still people. That just shows you the hardness of the human heart. Uh, even today, you could you could give ten arguments for the existence of God. You could give multiple evidences for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you could answer every question that a person has to their satisfaction, to the point where they would say, well, I can't argue with any of that, but I still don't want to believe. And you know what, that's when there was, a, there was an evangelist, his name was Paul Little, uh, and he died early, he died uh, just very, you know, very suddenly and it was not expected and he was not quite Billy Graham level but he was very famous and he would go to a lot of college campuses and he'd speak to college crowds and things like that and they'd say uh, you know Mr. Little why aren't there more scientists who are Christians and he'd say why aren't there more truck drivers who are Christians he said it's not an intellectual issue it's a moral issue it's an act of the will because if you if you believe this, if you say out loud, well, I believe that's true, well, then what happens next? You got to, it's like Philip said in the sermon yesterday, it's not just a matter of trusting, it's trust and 
For there's to be happy in Jesus, but to you guys are great. All right. So, you know, I, I hope you at home in the video, I hope you got to hear this one. Uh, so, all right. Let's do one more question and then we'll be done here. Uh, so, question five. Luke tells us that Paul was freshly filled with the Holy Spirit to show that his boldness, outspokenness, and power in condemning Elymas uh, were, all, were, were all from God. So why do you think Paul was so severe in his reprimand to him, which we established was pretty severe? Why do you think that was uh, the way Paul went about it? I think he was really mad that Elvin's trying to control the pro council. Okay. And I think that Elvis thought he was the God. Or, okay. Or equal to God. Or had some sort of divine manifestation right. of power. And I yeah. think that so enhanced Paul that he just, he, he got mad at him and he, he told him what he believed. Yeah. I think that those words came from Paul's heart. Yeah. Well, you couldn't let false teaching go. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, yeah, I think it's that I think it's a both and sort of yeah. thing. Right. He was not going to tolerate. It. I mean, I, I just want to say this without. You can't preach. I'll, otherwise, I'll try to be careful not to start preaching myself. But <laughs> um, the early church understood something that every generation of Christians ought. to to understand, and not just understand, but really believe. False teaching is nothing to wink your eye at. No, no, no. False teaching, it, I'm just going to say it this way, it, it can be soul damning. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it leads people astray, not only in their belief system, but it can also overflow into their behavior. Uh, and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of false teaching out there. And that's why Christians need to know the Word of God and be discerning. And that's why you should always pray before you ever read Scripture, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that I can understand and discern what your Word is teaching. And then if you're not sure, which, I mean, how many of us have read something and not been, you know, not been sure? Um... Go to somebody who maybe is a little bit further down the road, and and if you want some really good resources, you're always welcome to come over to my office and look at my commentaries. You can go online. There's, I know there's plenty of junk online, but there's some good stuff online, and you can read up about things. But you may be the only person who might represent Jesus in the lives of people in your life. And you may be the only time they get to hear that whatever it is, and it doesn't mean you're wagging your finger, you're not being judgmental in some sinful way, but you're being a godly director and guide to help them say, oh, that direction is not the direction you want to head in. And I, I and then it's always good when you can kind of share your own testimony. I, I was moving in that direction, or I was moving in a similarly unhelpful direction or ungodly direction and someone came along because they loved me and cared for me and I love you and care for you and I just don't want to see you you know move in the wrong direction so don't ever do it like you're wagging your finger and uh, trying to make them feel guilty it's not about that it's about loving them and caring for them and helping them move in a, a godly direction and a direction of truth so um, all right I see so, yeah I see here where it's saying that Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit yes. and he set his eyes on him. So that really just, well, so to me it was even on a deeper level. It was the Holy Spirit talking to the demon spirit yeah. Yeah. In, the, in that man. Yeah. It was like, uh-uh. Okay, so if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, as Paul was, I'm going to make a connection here. What Spirit. This is going to give it. This is going to give it away. Um, what group of being 
were always the ones who recognized Jesus for who he was. It was never the people, it was always the demons. They always recognized Jesus immediately. So Saul 